Okay, awesome. Let's get started. Um, so just now, my colleague uh, Jogan has a really comprehensive review on EQA and the vision reasoning. So um, today I will be covering another popular topic for vision and language, which is visual captioning. I'm Rowe from Microsoft, uh, so uh, I'm colleague of Jogan. And so let's get started. So here's the outline of my talk. I want to first give you a brief overview on the problem and then lay out the taxonomy of the problem of uh, visual captioning. Then, then we will go into our first technical session on uh, image captioning and also the associated data sets and the evaluation metrics. And after that, we will go from the image domain to the video domain and look at um, methods on video description generation. And I will mainly focus on two advanced topics for video description generation. Uh, one is grounded caption generation, and the other one is dense caption generation. Uh, hi, jo uh, can you make sure you are recording now? I, I couldn't see the, the icon, but just Oh, do. yeah, uh, so, okay. yeah. So I'm doing recording. <clears throat> yeah, so uh, then after the, the, the two, topic, two topics on video description, I will leave a few minutes for the Q&A. So visual captioning aims to describe the content of an image or video with a natural language sentence. So here I show you an example on image and uh, another one on video. So for the image of this cat, um, the, the example model output should look like this. A cat is sitting next to a pine tree looking up. And for this video, we should uh, expect to see something like a dog is playing piano with a girl. So know that uh, in this tutorial, we focus on factual captioning. So we want to see what content is in the image, in the image or video and make sure that the captions can be grounded the words in the caption can be grounded into a visual content uh, as opposed to other related topics such as commenting. So there's some applications of visual captioning. Uh, one and perhaps the most popular one is auto text generation. That's actually a uh, auto text generator from PowerPoint. So whenever we upload an image to PowerPoint, there's an option for us to um, generate and display the auto text. So in this case, PowerPoint generates a cat sitting on top of a grass covered field. And so the reason why we need this is that like there are a lot of people, uh, blind people and visually impaired people in the world. And we also want them to appreciate the content in the image. So once we have the auto text, we can use a speech synthesizer to um, just speak the auto text out. And the second application is content based image retrieval or CBIR. So traditionally for image to text or text to image retrieval, uh, we use uh, the text or descriptions of the image as the evidence for indexing. But you know, sometimes uh, those uh, text or descriptions are, are unavailable. So we need to figure out a way to uh, use a captioning model to uh, generate a description by ourselves. And finally, of course, we can use a visual captioning just for fun. And here's a fun video shot by Kyle McDonald a few years ago. And so he literally uh, run a real-time uh, image captioning model on his laptop and walk around the city and to see the quality of the captions. So as you can see, the captions uh, sometimes are pretty good and especially on common objects. Now for the uh, taxonomy of visual captioning, and I want to uh, divide, uh, uh, so look at the, this from two aspects. So if you uh, think of it from the domain aspect, uh, there are two main categories, image uh, in the image domain and in the video domain. And in the video domain, you can further divide it into two subcategories. Uh, one is with short videos, uh, usually of a few seconds long, and the other type is with long videos. So you can uh, get, get to see longer videos of a few minutes long probably. And on the, the other side of the graph, uh, we can also divide um, existing methods into three main categories. So template-based, retrieval-based, and deep learning-based. So uh, for the sake of the time, we will focus in on the most recent deep learning-based methods. And also uh, this tutorial is focusing more of the advanced, uh, like recent topics. So we will uh, get to know, uh, see a lot of uh, methods on, uh, based on deep learning 
and see a variety of methods from this category. All right, so the first method is CNN LSTM. So that's perhaps uh, the, the, the one of the first deep learning based methods. And the problem is formulated as the following. So we want to, uh, so theta represent the parameters in the model. So we want to uh, max, uh, find the optimal parameters that can optimize the log probability of the sentence given the image and have uh, summed them up across the whole data set. So if we apply a trend rule to this formulation, we will see something like this. So essentially, it will become a sequence to sequence problem. So given an image, we first uh, generate the first word, and then given the word we generated before and the image, we output the next word and so on. And that gets us to the first uh, CNN LSTM based methods, which is called show and tell. So in this framework, uh, given an image, we first use the common S to, to generate the feature a feature vector. And once we have the feature vector, we, out, we feed it to an LSTM module, which output the probability for the next word. So during training, we can use uh, tech, uh, some techniques like teacher forcing training to make sure uh, we are, gener we are uh, uh, applying the cross entropy laws to the correct words at the output distribution. And during inference, uh, we, do, we can do all sorts of sampling like uh, grade, grade search or beam search to sample um, uh, words from the output distribution. And show and tell is a one example of the encoder decoder framework. So basically you, you, will, you, are, you will see a lot of um, methods fall into this category. So encoder decoder uh, framework essentially use a visual encoder to, um, to take in the image or video input and encode them into an embedding space and then feed this uh, feature vector to a language decoder which output a description. And so uh, that's one limitation with uh, the very first model we have seen today. So for, for CNN LSTM framework, uh, because we are applying a mean pooling at the end of the feature map, so we are losing all the, the spatial information. So, uh, but you might say, okay, uh, to generate the sentence, we might not only just uh, look at the whole thing. We, we want to like dynamically attend to uh, different regions in the image. So that's why later on, uh, people propose to use uh, soft attention for image captioning. And soft attention uh, is initially proposed for machine translation. And if you think about machine translation is also a sequence to sequence problem. So soft attention is able to uh, dynamically attend to uh, input content based on the query. So what does the query mean, you might ask? So there are three uh, main elements in soft attention, uh, query Q, keys K, and the values V. And I will get to a quick example in the next couple of slides so you get a better sense. So in our case, um, in our context, everything is simplified. So the keys and the values are usually identical. So you can think about them usually come from the same uh, feature representation. So in our case, uh, for example, the gray feature of the common net output. And the query queue is determined by the global image feature or the LSTM hidden states. Let's get to the example. So uh, say given the same cat image we see from earlier, we first use a CNN to compute the gray feature for the image. So in this case, uh, so normally you will see like a seven by seven or 14 by 14 outputs uh, with the uh, channel size of 2000, say 2048. So here for sim simplicity, I draw a three by three gray feature. So uh, in soft attention, this part is regarded as the values and the key. And then uh, we now we start a generation. We need to find the query to query on our uh, this memory, these values and the keys. So we do a mean pooling over the gray feature and get S zero. And then we can perform a soft attention uh, over the keys and values. So basically, we compute the similarity score between H and S zero. So uh, using the similarity function called FATT. So FATT uh, usually is a dot product or uh, some uh, neural, uh, like MLP neural network. And uh, in most recent work, like transformer, uh, people start to use a scaled uh, dot product to avoid uh, gradient issues. So once we have the alignment scores and we apply a soft max to make sure all the attention ways alignment score sum up to one. And that's because uh, when we uh, do a weighted sum between the attention weights and the keys and values, 
we want to make sure we don't get any uh, gradient issues uh, at this stage. And so now we have the evidence uh, for caption generation, we fit it to say a LSTM like we did uh, in the previous model, and then we output, output all, um, the output distribution, probability distribution for the next word. And we repeat the process until we hit the end token. So the takeaway from here, from this, uh, um, the basic model is uh, at each time step of decoder, we use a different context vector that looks at different parts of the image, uh, the input image. So this, uh, um, the concept is really important. So we will uh, get to use this uh, quite often in the, uh, in the later content. So here is a, a, a over, uh, like some visualization on the model output. So we overlay uh, the tension weights with the original image. So you see some uh, bright regions and dark regions. So bright regions correspond to uh, um, a tension weights with high values and, and vice versa. So you, as you can see, while generating the sentence, uh, the model is able to look at different regions in the image. Uh, there are more examples from this slide. So, uh, say for the in the first case, uh, when we generate in dark, uh, we are able, we are the model is able to uh, stare at the dark. And in the second example, when we mention stop sign, the model is able to attend to the right region, and later uh, so on for the third and fourth image. So, um, I I talk, so that's a basic uh, form for self attention and. Ever since it's proposed, there are um, ne numerous like um, variants of uh, self-attention proposed, and one of the famous one is uh, the region attention. So essentially, it's a variant of uh, self-attention based on the feature input. So we talk about uh, using the gray feature uh, from commonness as the input, and uh, region, region attention essentially replaced the input with the region proposal features. So if you look at the diagram, um, we now replace the CNN backbone with the off-the-shelf, say off-the-shelf fast uh, CNN, like off-the-shelf object detector. And then uh, we can get the region proposals and uh, correspond to each region proposal, we will have a feature vector. All right, so region retention is one of the fancy uh, attention uh, proposed recency. And there are also other um, uh, really fancy attention mechanisms. And in the next uh, few slides, I will uh, briefly go through uh, some of them. So the first one is semantic attention. So it adopts a concept called uh, uh, visual attributes. So given an uh, input image, we run an attribute classifier on top of it so that we can get some uh, visual concepts from the image. So in this case, we got wave, writing, man, surfboard, and so on. So once we have these uh, visual attributes, uh, the language decoder uh, can use that as evidence to generate output caption. And the second model is called adaptive attention. So uh, previously we talked about like how the model is able to attend to different spatial regions in the image. But you know, uh, sometimes uh, when we generate some non-object words, we do not have to attend to the image at all. So, um, in this case, the language model can totally do the heavy lifting. So uh, in this work, uh, they propose a concept called a visual sen sentinel. So the visual sentinel is able to tell the model uh, when to and when not to attend to the image. So the third architecture is called attention on attention. So if you look at the, the left hand side, the diagram, so module A corresponds to the uh, classic uh, attention module with query keys and values. And the, the module they propose is showing module B, and they actually have a um, attention module at the bottom. And the idea here is uh, we want to do some more intensive fusion between the query and the keys and the values. So they, they actually they literally uh, use the query multiple times such that they can use uh, it to gate from the, the attention output to have a more intensive interaction. And the fourth model is called X-linear attention. So X-linear attention, so the models we talked about before, uh, those are all performed on, uh, the attention is performed on the channel, uh, channel level. So the, uh, say, if you think about dot products, you are doing uh, element-wise multiplication according to different channels. But um, how about the interactions between channels, right? So in this work, uh, they propose uh, to use a bilinear pooling to model the interaction between channels. 
These two methods focus mainly on the, uh, the data format, so the data input. So in hierarchy parsing in this work, they use a tree structure to, um, to model the regions from the image. And in the second work, uh, they use a scene graph and to model um, the image content, image regions, and tags. And then uh, transfer the inductive bias learned from the language to image. And now going to um, even more recent works. Um, so we talk about self-attention and um, initially proposal for, for machine translation. So the, actually, so that makes a machine translation a natural source for people to um, and take like to uh, think about some new ways for image captioning. And one recent method is called a transformer and is proposed in a paper you probably heard of, attention is all you need from New Rips 2017. And transformer performs a sequence to sequence generation and uh, it got really impressive results on machine translation. And so people start to uh, extend it to uh, image captioning because image captioning is also a sequence to sequence task. So uh, one important component in self-attention is the, sorry, in transformer is a self-attention module. So self-attention is essentially a self-attention uh, model that attends to itself. And we'll get to an example in the next slides. And self-attention is a special case of uh, graph, graph neural networks. So uh, at this point, um, I think my colleague Zhe also briefly mentioned that. And so self-attention essentially has a fully connected graph as, a, as opposed to uh, a sparse uh, structure, uh, some sparse architecture in uh, graph uh, neural networks. And sometimes uh, we use uh, self-attention to model the relationship between object regions. So similar to uh, what we have seen in the uh, existing works like hierarchy, parse, hierarchy parsing. So in that case, uh, people use a, a graph commonness to model the relationship. So I, here I showed you um, um, ex uh, like one, one layer transformer uh, model. So uh, transform, uh, one of the first applications of transformer in uh, visual captioning is proposed by uh, my uh, 2018 CVPR work. And so the idea is quite simple. So if you look at the diagram and focus on uh, say the, the left hand side for, for now. So if you look at the self attention layer, it takes in keys, values and uh, queries. So all those three are identical to each other. Uh, so if we don't account for the, the linear embedding layer, so we can assume they are the same. And then we use, uh, um, so the in, at the input, we fit in the image features or video features such that the self-attention layer can encode the relationship between the regions, between the, the video frames. And at the output, we fit in words like what we, what we, what we do for uh, LSTM. So uh, usually we need to follow the autoregressive property. So when we are generating the current word, we can only look at words from the past, but not the future. But recently there are some uh, non-autoregressive uh, model proposed uh, such that even during inference, we can output all the words simultaneously at the same time. So that's a basic transformer architecture. And uh, so um, there are some more recent works uh, called object relation transformer and mesh memory transformers, and they are all based on the basic uh, transformer network uh, architecture. So I will point you to the, the references I pointed out uh, uh, below. So if you're interested on this topic, you can go ahead and do some uh, further readings. All right, moving on. Uh, so uh, uh, like um, really natural extension uh, from transformer to um, uh, to the next stage, uh, given the revolution going on in the NLP field, uh, like all the pre-training stuff going on, um, a natural extension is uh, to apply pre-training to uh, image captioning. So those methods usually have uh, adopt two-stage training strategy. So the first stage is pre-training and the second stage is fine-tuning. So for pre-training, uh, it's usually performed on a large data set. So I'm talking about like millions of uh, image and text pairs. And those texts are usually automatically generated. And say, uh, there's a data set called conceptual captions. And in that data set, they take uh, web images and associated author text of the, the web image as the supervision, as the annotation. So the training uh, objective is usually unsupervised and they are task independent. 
because we want to learn a generic representation um, in the pre-training stage. And for fine tuning, the stage two is more task specific. So we apply, we take the model we learn from pre-training and then fine tune it on various downstream tasks with, uh, with usually a supervised objective. So all those methods are based on BERT, uh, a variance of transformer. So regarding this part uh, for pre-training, uh, my colleagues uh, and, uh, from Microsoft and Facebook, they will um, talk about more details and have a more detailed overview. So uh, here I want to focus um, on works related to uh, image captioning or visual captioning. So there are two main categories for uh, VLP-based methods. The first is with a separate encoder decoder. So representative methods include video bird and OSCA. And the second category is with the unified encoder decoder and um, representative methods is unified, uh, unified VLP. So the difference is, so for the separate encoder decoder, uh, only the encoder is pre-trained. So uh, we need to uh, encode the vision features and then pass it to the language decoder. So this part is usually pre-trained. And in unified encoder decoder, uh, both modules are uh, pre-trained because we are using a unified architecture. So there are some benefits about uh, either, either one. So uh, the model of a unified uh, VLP is simpler. And, but on the other hand, uh, if you have a um, overall encode, like a really general uh, encoder, that will benefit um, more tasks, basically. So going to the, the benchmark and data sets. So the, the most popular uh, benchmark for image captioning is Coco Captions. And it ha contains uh, over 100K images for training and 5,000 each for validation and testing. And the organizers and the, the creators of the data set uh, withhold 40,000 images as the hidden test set. So that for uh, leaderboard purposes. And the vocabulary of the data set is over 9,000. Uh, with each word has at least five times occurrence. And this data set is mostly adopted in uh, uh, image captioning. And another data set uh, uh, commonly used is Flickr 30K and it has a significant uh, lower number of uh, images and the cap vocabulary is also smaller. So uh, for the sake of time today, we will mainly look at results on Coco captions. So here are some uh, images from the data set. Uh, as you can see, most of the objects are quite common, like a baseball uh, player and bus and so on. Moving on to the evaluation metrics, um, I want to uh, briefly go through four uh, commonly used metrics, blue, material, cider, and spice. And so blue is, uh, is based on engram-based procedure and the material uh, further consider the ordering information between the, the, the n-gram, the unigram matching. And CIDR uh, gives more weight age to important n-grams through uh, TFIDF. So you know, uh, there are some words, certain words like the, uh, like those words uh, that's commonly exist in uh, most of the captions. So you don't want that to have a high weight. So you want to lower the weight for those words. And finally, SPICE is an F1 score over a caption a single of tuples. So it's a more uh, fine-grained matrix that consider uh, different components of the sentence, like verb, nouns, and so on. And if you're interested, uh, you can go to uh, these uh, awesome slides from a uh, science lecture from uh, University of Toronto. And so here I want to um, show you some uh, quantitative results on uh, COCO benchmark. And um, before going into the numbers, um, I, I want to say, uh, so the reason why we uh, show the numbers is quite, uh, because they're quite intuitive, but uh, that's of course not the only criterion like to, to justify the performance of a model. So if you're interested in knowing, um, dive deep into each of the methods, uh, I would recommend you to uh, look at each paper for the, uh, say, the qualitative results, visualizations, and more analysis. So getting back to the numbers. So for uh, CN, the first uh, type of methods we covered, CNN LSTM, it got uh, 20 in uh, blue at four. So uh, foreground-based four blue. And moving on to uh, attention-based methods, uh, we we see a significant improvement. So it goes uh, from 20 all the way to 36. 
And so I also here I put a note here. So for region attention for this method, uh, you also use a cider optimization. So uh, it's an IO based method and um, potentially give us a few uh, give a few points boost. But overall, the performance is significantly better than um, the CNN L stand based method. And for the later uh, transformer based methods, uh, we again seen um, some improvements, and especially for CIDR. So, as you can see, uh, CIDR went all the way from 120 to over uh, 132. And finally, the most recent uh, transformation in uh, image captioning, uh, we have seen uh, further improvements. So, the latest number on CIDR is now at 140. All right, so there are also other topics uh, I would want to cover, but for the sake of time, we will leave it for uh, further readings. For example, uh, dense captioning, novel object uh, captioning, and stylized, diverse, stylized captioning or diverse captioning and RL-based methods. So I link you to a, um, a, a survey below. So if you want to, uh, get, to uh, get to see more references on each of the topic. So now moving on to the video domain. And we talk about um, captioning each individual image. So that corresponds to the middle part. So uh, say uh, we sample a few frames from the image and caption each frame. But now, so say we have a long video and uh, essentially you can look at a lot of consecutive frames. And uh, so now we want to, and those frames uh, also has a lot of other information like motion information and we want to capture. So now the task becomes how to uh, capture those motion informations, how to caption over uh, a period of time. So that's correspond to the video captioning problem. And here I want to uh, uh, maybe um, uh, put it in a, a video description instead of video captioning because uh, uh, video ca captioning also refer to uh, relevant concepts in uh, the speech field. So it's used uh, sometimes represent uh, from speech to text uh, transcript generation. So to avoid the confusion, uh, in this talk, I will uh, for now put it uh, like a video description. So for video description, the methods are um, uh, quite similar to what we have covered so far. So people have used the auto, uh, encoder decoder and attention and the transformer uh, for the modeling. and. Uh, we, we also pay special attention. So in the video domain, we pay special attention to uh, capture the, the temporal information, the motion information. So to do so, um, there are a few, there are various methods proposed. So to capture the, the local information, the motion information, we uh, sometimes we use a, CN, a 3D CNN and also the optical flow. And to capture longer uh, temporal information, uh, we have tried, um, say, using LSTM, using transformer and attention, so that we can capture the long-term dependencies. And so that was the overview about uh, video descriptions. And now I want to move on to like two more advanced topics on um, uh, video description. So um, for all those methods we have covered so far, uh, they focus on mainly uh, description generation. So we want to output a caption. But sometimes um, up, output caption alone is not enough, especially in the real world scenario. So say, uh, given an image like this, uh, I would say our model can output a perfect description as a bottle of ketchup and a bottle of sriracha are on a table, but it doesn't know which is which. So if unfortunately our robot chef made a wrong association and put sriracha instead of ketchup in our hot dog, that would be a total disaster. So we want to avoid a disaster by ground the words in the image correctly. So we want, to, want the model to have this grounding ability. And then we have a perfect hot dog. So essentially, we want to combine visual description and uh, object grounding or detection. And in the image domain, uh, a method called neural baby talk was proposed. And in the video domain, um, uh, uh, there's a method called the grounded video description. So to, uh, for the sake of time, we won't go into uh, model details, but if you want to uh, know more, uh, there's a, a link to um, the workshop from yesterday's uh, activity in that uh, workshop. And so for both methods, so, so in both image domain and the video domain, uh, we require special data set that has both descriptions and the bounding box annotations. 
So uh, at least for now, all the all those methods use a, a su full supervision. So they need the bounding box uh, as a training signal. So uh, for image, that's simple. So we can just uh, um, parse the sentence and annotate the objects and the, draw some bounding box on the image. But how about video? So videos are more complicated and it contains a lot of frames. And so how about, and so I want to give you a few examples. So for video, um, dance annotation would be really uh, time consuming and expensive. And also we, uh, we care about the connection. Uh, we are not doing exhaustive like object detection. We don't want to annotate every single object in the, in the video. So our point is more uh, grounding. So we want to build a connection between the two modalities, uh, the visual modality and the text modality. So uh, that's why we draw different bounding boxes on the uh, one of the frame. So sparsely annotate one of the frame. And uh, you might say, uh, you might say uh, what if we cannot do it in one frame? Then in that case, uh, people propose to annotate um, uh, multiple frames. So in this case, the ball is invisible in the first frame, and um, that's why it's uh, annotated in a different frame. And that's conclu uh, for uh, that's uh, concludes the uh, the grounded description part. And so far, all the encoder decoder frameworks works fairly well for images and the short uh, video clips. But how about long videos? So we haven't got to, uh, haven't talked a lot, a lot about uh, long videos. And in fact, uh, the average video duration on YouTube is over four minutes. So how about those videos? And in 2016 CVPR, you at all proposed a method called a video paragraph description. So now given a full length video, we generate an entire paragraph to describe it, which might contain multiple sentences. So, um, but that's a, that's a big improvement, but there's some limitations. So first, the readability of the paragraph is low. So it's a big text trunk. And second, we, uh, the association between the two modalities are not that strong. So say we want to know uh, how to chop bacon, uh, we want to see, we also want to see the visual demonstration to localize that clip in the video accordingly to have this kind of temporal grounding. And that's why there's a problem proposed called dense video description and got a lot of tension recently. And so we have to talk about the left hand part um, in this diagram. So now given a long video, we want to first identify a few events in the video and then I'll put a caption per events. And the input will be a video and output will be triplets of event start time, end time and description. So there are some existing methods uh, on dance video captioning or description. So they usually contain two modules, uh, events proposal and a video description. So events proposal uh, output uh, candidates, each candidate have a start time step and time step and the confidence goal. And those methods uh, fall into three main uh, categories. So the first one is with the separate training. So uh, we want to make sure we got a best events proposal and then feed those uh, events to caption decoder for caption generation. And the second category in the middle are uh, using the alternating training. So now we share uh, the video encoder between the two modules such that we can uh, have a more generic representation. And there are some limitations with those two methods. Um, the language information cannot direct have impact on the events proposals. So if you think about it, uh, if you know uh, a step, uh, there's a caption about add bacon to the pen. There are bacon and the pen in the, in, uh, in the video. So that will help you to better locate that events in the video. That's why later on, end-to-end uh, -end based methods is proposed. So there's a differentiable link between the two modules. And for the sake of time, I will not go into details for the model. And if you are interested in more details, I show, uh, so uh, there are more recent methods come from yesterday's uh, activity net workshop. So I have put a link below, so in case you're interested. And to conclude, uh, we have seen a really aggressive progress in the field. So on Cocoa Captions, uh, for example, uh, we, we see the cider goes from uh, lower than 100 all the way to 140. And so one thing I wanna point out is that like the motivation is important. So we want to know why we made a change and what does each change um, contribute to the outcome, to the contribute to the model performance. And we will definitely avoid piping up those uh, deep uh, neural network Legos. 
And uh, uh, at the end of the, the, uh, the talk, I talk more about uh, grounding. So uh, to achieve a, a better result interoperability, we need to have grounding and to, towards a better uh, generalizable and uh, robust model, uh, pre-training is one option. So regarding this, uh, we will have a, a full session on self-supervised learning at the end of the tutorial. And that will provide more insights and on regarding this point. So there are some limitations um, about uh, visual captioning. So there's a still a long way before uh, production ready due to the following issues. So first is recognition failure and also object hallucination and then model bias. So regarding the first one, uh, we, we need to figure out to get a better uh, feature. And for object hallucination, we aim to have a better grounding and detection approach. And for model uh, biases, there are some uh, recent work uh, in VQA that use uh, adversarial training to alleviate the biases. And also there are some works in captioning uh, as well. So that's a really important um, topic. And all three, all three um, if we can solve um, the, uh, all the three problems, that will be really promising uh, towards production ready and the next level of uh, image captioning and video captioning. So for future directions, um, so, so far, um, people have, uh, there are a lot of work proposed to improve the evaluation metrics and make them uh, correlate, correlate better with human judgments, but um, still there's a gap between uh, automatic metrics and the human evaluation. That's why in the video domain in particular, uh, a lot of papers still use a human judgment, human evaluation to get the most accurate feedback. So uh, that's a one interesting direction to go. So how to propose an evaluation metrics that can correlate better with the human judgment. And another point, uh, so uh, Zhe also mentioned in the VQA um, talk. So we want to, um, so people start to revisit uh, uh, previous models like great features and which surprisingly give even better results. So we want to, the benefit here is that um, we can simplify the model pipeline. We don't need to have a really heavy um, uh, model like a data pre-processing at the beginning. So we can just uh, let everything run end to end that will greatly like um, shorten the like a product uh, timeline, time cycle. And uh, lastly about v VLP. So um, an, an interesting thing to think about is to uh, how to close the gap between the pre-training domain and the downstream data domain. So, uh, so for pre-training, we use uh, uh, web images and for downstream tasks, we use Coco, VQA and those are more uh, curated data sets. So, and also there are some uh, domain gap between um, uh, web images. Say if you want to apply to uh, cooking images, uh, that, will, that will normally fail. So you, we need to figure out like, so how to close the gap and how to make sure uh, the pre-training, we can optimize like the pre-training, the knowledge we learn from pre-training and transfer to downstream task. And that's all for my tutorial. And thank you all so much for your attention. And I will now take a few questions.